talking about what happens when time runs out. When your life on earth ends here, it's not the end of you. It's just the end of your life on the earth. And so what happens after that? And we've gone through talking about a literal hell, a place of torment. We've talked about how that many will get what they say they want, which is nothing to do with God or complete separation from God. And we emphasized in that message, the opening message, that there has no person ever lived on this planet, whether they believed in God or didn't believe in God, that has lived without the presence of God because His presence has always been and is always. And that hell will literally finally be a place of complete separation from God. We talked about heaven, the literal real heaven, that there are streets there, that there is water there, there are trees there, that the Bible alludes to the fact that there are probably animals there, and it, it, is, it is a beautiful, beautiful place, the habitation of God. The habitation of all the things that you and I have desired or longed for, our families and friends who have loved God, lived for Him, and committed their lives to Him, that have left this earth and now that's their home, and we will be reunited with them and there forever, the home of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. And as we think through those things and, and what that means to us, it brings us to this point today to talk about our grand appointment or meeting with God. God has set on His calendar a meeting that every individual will have with Him. And we're talking this morning not to those who don't know Christ or don't have a personal relationship, but we're talking about those who do, and it's, it's theologically termed or called the, the great white throne of judgment with Christ, where every Christian, every believer will stand before God and make an account for their life on the earth. What is it that God will be looking for in that meeting, and what is it that God wants in that meeting to read about it, I want to share with you 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. You can read 1 through 10 if you like, but for the, our purposes this morning, I want to zero in on this to let you know there's going to be an appointment and a meeting for all of us. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. We need to understand that this appointment that we have with God is not an appointment that we can reschedule. It's not an appointment that uh, you and I can miss. It is a, an appointment that is, that is impending. It is, a, it is an appointment that's predestined. It is an appointment that all of us will make, that all of us individually will be in the presence of God, and we will stand before Him and make an account of what we have done in the body. But before we start talking about those things, I need to lay a little groundwork for you about what it means to be in Christ. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says, By faith we have been made acceptable to God, and now because of our Lord Jesus Christ, we live at peace with God. We need never forget that Jesus is the God of second chances. And that in this life is our opportunity to course correct. And much of what we're going to talk about this morning is going to cause us to wonder or to think, are there areas and places where we need to course correct in our lives and prepare for that grand meeting when we stand before God? You see, it's not going to be a meeting of, you know, you are rejected and therefore get out of here. Or, you know, you are, you're accepted, but we're not really happy about it. You got a D. You are hanging on by just the, you know, skin of your teeth. And in fact, a D minus, but don't you know, go in the back gate. That's not this meeting, okay? Because we belong to him. This meeting is about faithfulness. It's about his character and, and asking us, how were you like me when you accepted me and, and walked with me on the earth? And we're going to go over those things in just a moment. John chapter 3, verse 17 says, God sent His Son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through Him. The Bible says that we have complete access to God. 
And He welcomes us right now. We don't have to wait for the impending meeting that's coming. And He hopes to help us make course corrections and get ready for the meeting that He's going to have with us where He asks us, what did you do with what I gave you? Where, he, where, he, where we stand before Him and we make an account for what we did in the body. So with that understanding that it's a meeting that has great weight to it, it's a meeting that is something that is sobering for us. And yet, also, it is, it is a meeting, though, where God is just looking to say, well done, you've been faithful over a few things. You didn't ace everything, weren't perfect. I love you. I prepared the way for you. I am so glad you're here. Come on in. Enter into the faithfulness of the Lord. Seven ways that God is going to judge our faithfulness when we stand before the great white throne of judgment. And I want you to take notes on this, and I want you to think through this, and I want us to begin to do some course correction in preparation for that grand meeting. We are all going to be there. We are all going to stand before the Lord. The first thing is that we, we will be judged there based on do you possess the right values do you possess the right values you see a faithful person knows the importance between you know what is what is really important in life and 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 what is not so important in life a faithful person has appropriate and right values there they understand there's a difference between doing right things and doing things right they understand that you can be sincere and be sincerely wrong they understand that there is a right way that God would lead us. There's a righteous way that God would have us to live on the earth. And a faithful person knows uh, the, the significance apart from the trivial in life. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 20, A faithful man will be richly blessed, but one eager to get rich will not go unpunished. Now this verse is contrasting faithfulness with a desire to get rich quickly. It's a, it's a beautiful picture of, of a weakness in humanity that we can fall prey to, that we can, uh, we can be seeking our own best interest and, and rather than seeking to glorify God. I like the way that David Wilkerson said it several years ago. Am I having trouble with this mic? Is it on? We're good? I like the way David Wilkerson said it several years ago. He said that all that we do for Christ will not be rewarded. All that we do for Christ will not be rewarded. You could just hear the hush fall over the congregation. Because that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that all that we do for His glory is what gets rewarded. We do a lot of things in His name, and we appreciate the applause, and we like the pats on the back, and all of the glory doesn't go to Him. But when we stand in the shadow and we do what we do for His glory, that's what God wants to reward. And those who understand what His values are, those who are faithful to what God honors and, and what God rewards, then those are, are those who are walking with God when we stand before Him in that, in that great white throne of judgment, and He says, did you have the right values? They can answer yes. Listen, God, when... Everybody else was swimming this way. I was swimming this way. Our culture right now is trying to turn us and, and, and get us going in particular directions and, and kind of get a, a, a corporate thought about particular items, agendas, and ways. But in Christianity, we're called to value Him, to follow Him, to, to obey Him. And so that means that we're swimming against the stream. We're going against. And I, I've had people before that told me, man, this, you know, being a Christian, you know, it's, it's been pretty easy. And, and I would say, you're not doing it right. <laughs> right? If it's easy, you're not doing it right. Okay? When you're swimming against the stream, that's not easy. You know, one of the first times that my, my dad took us out to the river, and, and it just happened to be after a rain, kind of like what we've, a little bit what we experienced here, and 
the waters were raging. They were up, and we went to uh, a little river out in the, in the desert in Arizona, and it was really coursing through the canyons. And, and so, you know, we got on these inner tubes, and we, we left our campsite back here, and we tubed down the river about a mile. Well, we found out that it was easier to go down than to come back up. It was, there were places where the thickets and things were, you know, were so strong, we thought we can't really walk through the path here, we're going to have to get back in the river and swim. And man, I'm telling you, it took a long time to get back to camp. When you're swimming against the flow, there's, it's difficult, isn't it? The second thing when we stand before God is He wants to know, do you care for the interest of others? Do you care for the interest of others? John chapter 13, verse 35, your love for another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Faithfulness swims against the stream, sets an example, but shows love to everyone who's around. Demonstrates that, that God cares about them and loves them. And when we are living for God, He wants to know when He meets with us, did you, did you show my love? Did they know that you belonged to me because you loved incredibly? Because the kind of way that you loved was so different. Our world has such a confused idea about what love is today. You know, they, they feel like that, that love is, I want you, you want me, we should be together, regardless of everything else. But you and I know that the Bible teaches us that love is self-sacrificing. And sometimes a person has to say, I think I want you but what's best for you is me not in your life. What's best for you is to allow you to pursue what God has planned for you. And I need to pursue what's best for me, what God has planned for me. That is, that's foreign to our world. That a world just say, you know, what is it? Two people love each other. What does it matter? They should be able to be together. And it's so foreign to them to try to understand that love is self-sacrificing. That love is, is looking out for what is in the highest and the best interest of the other person. The third thing that God wants to know about us in terms of our faithfulness is do we live with integrity before an unbelieving world? Do we live with integrity before an unbelieving world? Colossians chapter 4, beginning at verse 4, Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. Live wisely among those who are not uh, believers and make the most of every opportunity let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you have the right response for everyone in other words a mark of faithfulness is a is our testimony in how we had related to those who didn't know christ to those who were unbelievers what was it about our relationships the way we live, the integrity of our life that demonstrated to people who didn't believe in Christ that there was something going on in us that was different from the rest of the world. When God evaluates your faithfulness, He won't be looking at your communication and those skill sets. He won't be examining you know, whether or not you, you did uh, a, a, a thing, a particular style or way, but he is going to be looking at the heart of the matter and the motive of the matter and how you treated those who didn't know him. How you showed him to those who were unbelievers. And he wants to know if there was, a, there was an integrity of character about the way that you related to people that were unbelievers. And when we stand before him, that's one of the questions he's going to want to know. What, what did those who didn't know me Think about me when they met you. There's a, there's a lot of people that want to wear the title of, of Christian. And, and our world in general, I mean, they've done survey after survey, and it keeps coming up that the historical uh, person of Jesus ranks high across the world, even in other religions. They think if that's the truth, if a person was like that, they lived like that, that's incredible. I would want to be around that person. And then when we, when we look at that compared to what do you think about Christians today, it falls almost to the bottom. What it tells me is that there's a lot of people that want to wear his name, but don't really want to be like him. 
They used to say to us in, in, uh, in, loosely in Bible school, you know, afterwards, they said, if you do what he did and you say what he said, you may get what he got. And that's why a lot of us are fearful about launching into really living Jesus to unbelievers and people that are around us. We're afraid of ridicule. We're afraid of persecution. We're afraid of what might happen. Not getting promoted in a job, whatever it might be, whatever our fears are. But he's going to want to know, were you ashamed of me in front of unbelievers or did you live for me at every opportunity you had? The fourth thing is he wants to know, did you keep your promises? Proverbs chapter 20, verse 25, it's a trap to dedicate something rashly, only later to consider your vows. We're going to park here for just a moment. (laughs) So pull a pin out, get ready. Promises. Do we keep our promises? Do we do what we say we're going to do? It's a measure by which people recognize followers of Jesus Christ because he keeps his promises. He's always kept his promises. And he expects that those who are following him, who, who are um, wearing his name, are going to be those who keep their promises. Listen to me this morning. It's easier to get into debt than to get out of debt. When you get into debt, you sign a, what do, you, what do they call those notes? Uh, promissory note. You sign a promise. You sign a promise that you're going to do what you said you would do. It is easier to get into a relationship than to get out of a relationship. And when we get married, we get a license and we sign that license. We enter into, as a Christian perspective, a covenant, which is a promise. And we make promises in our vows that we will be with one another until what happens? Till death. Till death does us part. We make a promise to follow through on this marriage relationship. It's easier to fill up our schedules, our calendars, than it is to fulfill our calendars, isn't it? That's a different story. I fill it up all day long. I am busy. Look at my calendar. But when we get to the end of the month, how much of it was fulfilled? Where did we say, I just got too busy? It just didn't work out. And we will stand accountable to God one day for saying, you filled your calendar with some appointments. Really, there were some divine appointments that I had set for you that were on that calendar. (coughs) You brushed over and went to the stuff you liked the best, and you missed them. You missed some great opportunities to do what I had called you to do. The Bible is saying that faithfulness is, is a matter of Uh, Not, you know, just you say it, but it's a matter of you do it. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 9, Understand, therefore, that the Lord your God is indeed God. He is the faithful God who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations and lavishes his unfailing love on those who love him and obey his commands. Number five. Do you develop your God-given gifts? He's going to stand here before us and ask us, did you develop the gifts that I gave you? The Bible is, emphasizes in a tremendous way the using of our gifts for the glory of God. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 says, Each should use whatever spiritual gift he has received to serve others faithfully, administrating God's grace in its various forms. I, I want you to notice that when you don't use your gift, somebody misses out. When you don't use and develop, fully develop the gift that you've had, somebody misses out. I've said this before, and I really believe it. I believe that the greatest tennis player has never picked up a tennis racket. The greatest baseball player has never swung a bat. And the greatest missionary, the greatest uh, biblical teacher, the greatest uh, pulpit preacher, the greatest, you know, uh, member of a congregation 
has, has never risen to those levels because something has stopped them and they've been fearful before they, they, they launched forward or, or something has held them back and they've not fully developed the gifts and the things that God has given them for their life. And we've all suffered loss. Books have not been written. You know, uh, messages have not been preached. People have not heard that should have heard from this individual. And it's because we have not fully developed the gifts and the talents of God. And we will stand one day and he'll say, you know, I gave you a lot. I gave you a lot of abilities, talents, skills. How did you use those while in the body, while you were on earth? I want to be able to say, God, and I did really, really exceptional, you know, compared to how I started out and and, you know, it was, it was pretty pitiful. I started, you know, preaching, and I had 10 pages, and it took me five minutes to get through it, and I was sweating and red-faced. And towards the end, I took a five-minute sermon and turned it into an hour. Aren't you proud of me, God? <laughs> I want to be able to stand before him and say, God, I did what you asked me to do with what you gave me. Because that's what he's going to want to know. Is what I gave you, what did you do with it? The sixth thing is, do you obey God's commands? In uh, John chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, obey my commands. I'd like you to underline, if you're looking this up in your, in your Bible, if you love me, underline, obey my commands. We can uh, be praised by others publicly and be walking in disobedience. It is so important that we understand that true success is obeying God. If at the end of the day, you can lay your head on the pillow and say, today, I obeyed God, you've been successful. That's a measure of God's success. You did what I asked you to do. Well done. Good. I, I'm, I, I'm so glad you obeyed me today. The seventh thing and last one that we're coming to is when we stand before God, He's going to ask us, did you pass on to others what you learned? The Bible talks a, a lot about the transference process, the importance of us understanding things, learning them, putting them in practice, and then teaching others, sharing it with others. In fact, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, it says, You have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. None of us would be here today if it hadn't have been for those who went before, for those who pre preserved the scriptures so that you and I could have them today, for those who laid their lives down for our faith so that we could, uh, it could be preserved and the message could be passed on, for those who have gone into uh, countries where it's illegal to have one of these, and it's illegal to talk about God and have shared uh, and taught and trained and equipped so that there's pastors for those, um, those, those uh, nations that are closed to the gospel. So there's teachers and, and workers there. We have so much to be grateful for. And you bring it down into, you know, recent time period, we are on a property and we are in buildings that there were people who paved the way for this. They paved the way so you and I could be here today, so we could sit in comfortable chairs and and be in a climate-controlled room so, and, and hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And how is it that, that we could be the beneficiaries of that and, and not look to the next generations and think, I have a responsibility to make sure that this place thrives and is available for the succeeding generations behind us that are coming to learn about Jesus Christ. You're here today because people paved the way for us to be here. So how is it then that I become faithful? Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23 illuminates it for us. It says, the fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness. One of the nine fruits of the Spirit is faithfulness. So how do we get ready for that great encounter? We need we need the, the Holy Spirit to bear fruit in us 
and the fruit of faithfulness is what we're looking for because we're going to stand before the one, Revelations 19, 11, whose name is Faithful and True. His name is Faithful and True. And we're going to stand before him and he's going to ask us to give an account of our faithfulness to him based on the things we've talked about today. And so part of the course correction is we, if this is not happening, if we're not bearing this fruit, we need to say, God, today, I need your Holy Spirit invasion in my life. I need to be bearing faithfulness. I don't want to just be a lemon tree. <laughs> I don't want to just be an orange tree. I want all nine of those fruits growing in my life. And when I stand in front of you, I want to be able to say that I was faithful. I lived faithfulness. You see, here's the deal. When you think about what does God want to hear from us at that meeting? What does God want to hear from us? What's the whole thing about? He wants to hear from us that we were faithful. Not that we mastered everything. Not that we didn't fall down occasionally. Not that we, you know... Uh, he made no mistakes and we were perfect. He just wants to hear that we were faithful with what he placed in our hands. Now, what is it that God wants to be able to say to us? Well, that's recorded in Matthew 25, verse 23. He wants to say, well done. Good and faithful servant, you have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in the master's happiness. Isn't that going to be great? You've been faithful over a few things. I want you to come in. Come share. This has all been prepared for you. Everything here. I want you to enjoy this. We're going to enjoy it together. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad that you were faithful and you followed me and did what I asked you to do. As our worship team comes and prepares, recasting real quickly in a summary, the time is now for us to prepare for this impending meeting. When God asks us, have you been faithful in values? Were your values, my values, have been faithful to them? Have you been faithful in loving others, the people that I've placed around your life, your immediate family, and some people that maybe were not so lovable, but I placed them there because I wanted you to love them. Did you love them? Third thing, have you been faithful in your integrity of character? How did unbelievers see me based on how they saw you? The fourth one, were you faithful in keeping your promises? When you made a promise, did you keep that promise? You made a financial promise, you kept the financial promise. You made, you know, a, a, a marriage promise, you kept the marriage promise. You made, you know, in every way when you made promises, people came to know you as a person of your word, that you kept your promises like I've kept my promises to you. Did, were you faithful in developing your gifts, the gifts that I placed in your life? Were you faithful in obeying me? Were you faithful in passing on what you had learned to others? And it makes us, it brings us to a point of saying, you know, how are we doing right now? Is there a need for a course correction? We talked about last night that in order to come to God, we have to be filled with the Spirit. And His Spirit invites us. And the moment that we accept you know, Him as our personal Savior, we're filled with the Spirit. But Acts talked about a baptism in the Holy Spirit that seemed to turn the whole world upside down. Disciples that were hit and miss, and we really kind of, you know, we're watching them, we get a little aggravated at them, you know, and we can't find them anywhere when Jesus is at the cross except for John and there's, you know, Peter denying Jesus and hiding out, and most of them are hidden and locked up in a room, worrying about their own lives. And something transforms in them when we get into the book of Acts, that these guys are no longer fearful for their own lives, but they're passionate about reaching unreached people with Jesus Christ. They're not worried about going to prison. They're not worried about being beaten. They're not worried about being crucified. They're worried about getting to the next place that God's sending them quickly and obeying him and his commands. They begin to bear fruit in the New Testament in some meaningful ways. And the Bible says that it literally turned their known world upside down. And I can't help but think that if this was something that happened in that time, that it's something that could happen today for you and I. 
that if there was a people in the book of Acts that decided to put God first and to go from house to house and break bread and, and to be sacrificial in how they lived so that others could know about Jesus Christ and that everything focused and zeroed on Him, they gave the glory and the honor to God, that if it happened then, it should and could happen now. Will you stand with me as our worship team leads us? And then I'm going to come back to talk to you.